I don't want to steal your story. You tell it really well. So I thought what we could start by doing today is first um, have you tell us about Climb Hire. Nissan, for those who don't know, is the CEO and founder of Climb Hire. So tell us about your company. And then uh, let's talk a bit about your background as well. How in the world you got to the point where you were founding this company in the first place? Can we start with maybe those two very broadly defined stories? Yeah, totally. Um, so um... There are many different origin stories to any new entity that gets created. Um, so I'll you know, tell you a little bit about one version of the story and then maybe we'll get to the second one too. Um, uh, three years ago, I was an entrepreneur in residence at LinkedIn and I had become increasingly interested in workforce and upskilling. And especially a couple of years ago, through, it was sort of before the pandemic and there was a lot of doom and gloom um, around kind of the future of work, jobs were disappearing, they were going offshore um, or robots were coming and they were making everything efficient. And between those two things, all of the jobs that people had seemed to be, you know, being talked about disappearing more and more. And um, I was, and, and a lot of the conversation centered around the coal miners in West Virginia in particular. And so, you know, I think a lot of the discussion was like, well, you know, if the coal miners could, you know, get onto Coursera or a platform of some kind like Salesforce or AWS and Amazon and all these different companies have um, ways that you can learn skills and that are in demand and you could upskill and that's what the coal miners could do. And voila, like then they would be, you know, newly minted for these in-demand jobs. Um, and when I went to LinkedIn, they put a referral button on their platform. And what they learned by doing that was that the vast majority of job seekers were getting jobs through referrals. And I started to just like think about that for my life. And I realized that Every job I've ever had has come through network and a referral and everybody I knew that's how they had their jobs. And the way that I've met Aaron is through a network um, uh, and a referral. And the way that I met the person who introduced me to Aaron was through another network and referral. And that person, like, it's like so much of the world goes round on this and knowing that so much of the world goes round on this um, is just, um, it made me think about those coal miners again. And I started to think like, okay, so now they go to LinkedIn learnings platform and they, you know, take a course in UX design or whatever, and they have some certification. So now what's going to happen? They're going to apply cold for jobs without anyone vouching for them, without any experience, who's going to care that they have this new certification? Are employers gonna look at that kind of resume? And the answer is no, they're not. Um, and so it became really clear to me that a workforce, that the workforce space was missing a key ingredient in upskilling, which was relationships. And that what was missing in the workforce space was a model that took into account in equal parts, networks, referrals, relationships, social capital, and all of the things that that encompasses. And at the same time, um, uh, um, uh, uh, in-demand skills. And that those things needed to happen in equal parts as opposed to the emphasis on the hard skills, which is the, in my opinion, the easiest thing, the easier part of the equation. Um, so I designed a model that um, thought about how could we build referral networks and really like create a lot of infrastructure around that. Um, and the way that we designed it was that the people who would be in the program that needed some sort of upskilling support, they are called climbers. Um, and once they got those first middle-class jobs, then they would come back and they would train the next set of climbers. And we call those people fellows. And each fellow has a pod and they work closely with a small community of people. And there's just a lot of focus on how do you build relationships and how do you talk, how do you ask good questions and how do you engage and how do you follow up? And we give people a lot of opportunities to build relationships with each other, to then build relationships with the alumni and also build relationships with middle-class professionals through the act of practicing, through the act of do, learning something hard, 
And in that process, they are building a network and a community at the same time. Um, and I guess I'll just finish with like the what is Climb Higher piece. It's, um, you know, the, we've only been around for a couple of years, but the outcomes are very, 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 very strong early outcomes. We have 87% of our alum have become, uh, have gotten, gone from low wage jobs that were paying below, you know, minimum wage um, or low livable wage to jobs that pay over 60,000. So an average of 20 to 40,000 in um, pay increase. Um, and the vast majority of alum have come back to be fellows and sort of continue to invest in the community. Awesome, Nita, that's really, it's fascinating to me. So I, I'm gonna wanna dive deeply into this and what it looks like and all, but but let's um, let's go back to the beginnings first. Can you tell us a bit about your life experience that got you here in the first place? I know you had a fascinating story kind of going out to college and everything that happened afterwards. Um, can you tell us how in the world you got to the point where you could launch Climb Higher in the first place? So, you know, I said before, there's many origin stories out there. Um, one is sort of a more intellectual origin story um, about kind of thinking that there is a missing piece in this whole workforce equation that I want to introduce into this space. The second is far more personal. Um, so when I was in first grade, I was labeled as a special education student. Um, and what that meant in my life is that people had very low expectations of me. Um, and um, that was devastating in many ways. And I, in, in many ways, just sort of, sort of like became the victim of low expectations. Like no one thought that I had aptitude. And as a result of that, I didn't learn very much. And as a result of that, I hated school. Um, and I graduated from high school with a 700 on my SATs um, and combined. Um, and um, I couldn't write a sentence that made sense to anybody. And I couldn't really read. Um, and I, and I, I had never read a book. Um, I graduated from high school without ever having read a book. And when I went to college, I, was, I got into college on academic probation and my college um, professor wrote at the top of my first midterm exam, is English your second language? Because she literally could not understand anything that I had written. Um, and um, it was a very painful realization that I like just had a lot of catch up work to do um, to sort of be on par with my peers. At the same time that all of this was happening, um, I had a boyfriend that I grew up with um, who I went to middle school and high school with. And he, um, I, I went to separate gendered schools because I also grew up in a very religious Jewish community in Los Angeles, an Orthodox Jewish community. So the girls and the boys were separated for school. Um, we had some youth development group stuff on the weekend. So my boyfriend had no label for me. He was the only person in my life in some ways that didn't have a label because I didn't go to school with him. And um, he had the diametrically opposite educational experience to my own where he was being primed to go to Harvard from a very young age. And by the time he was 15, he was writing the speeches for the mayor of Los Angeles and just had like a very strong academic and a strong community and a strong leadership background. Um, and um, so I spent a lot of my college life being the girlfriend of a Harvard student. And all of a sudden that label that I had had went from being a stupid kid label to the girlfriend of a smart kid label, which meant through osmosis essentially that I was smart. And the expectations were so different. And I realized in that process, like how much I actually loved learning and loved knowledge and was voracious and had an unquenchable thirst, but I didn't have skills. And there was a very painful period in my twenties where I had to do a tremendous amount of catch up work to do um, to build those skills back up. But all of that made me realize that I had been told in explicit and inexplicit ways from so much of my life that my aptitude was low. And I then stepped into my own potential and realized it. I've now built three organizations that have been successful over the last 20 years. And, um, and my mission in life is around helping people realize and understand their own human potential 
And um, so I open up each of our climber cohorts with a story and I hear very many of the climbers coming back and telling me about how my story is their story. Um, this experience, especially in communities of color for low-income students um, in particular is ubiquitous. And um, we have found a very, very savvy way to help people learn new things, learn hard things, learn them in community and watch them evolve into very different humans. Oh, I, I love that story, Nitsan. Um, I, so one thing that strikes me about this is that you are building both a company and an organization that is transforming people's lives. Um, I'm curious if you ever see those two goals or those two missions, do they ever come in conflict? If so, how do you balance the idea of building a profitable business versus helping people? Or if they don't come into conflict, how, you know, how did you make that a possibility? So one is we're not, we're not a for-profit, we're a non-for-profit, but we are a non-for-profit with a very strong revenue model. Um, and um, we have multiple ways for earning revenue, um, but all of it comes under the auspices of our mission is to create economic opportunity and mobility, and that is our North Star. Um, so when climbers um, come to our community, they all um, have to be earning below livable wage incomes. Um, and as a result of that, they're not in a position where they could pay. Um, and um, so we don't ask them to pay. Um, and what we do instead is we ask them, we even pay them actually. So if they you know, get accepted into the program, then they pay, uh, we pay them $75 a week based on homework completion and um, homework completion and attendance. And then once they get that middle-class job, then they pay it forward to the next climber who has had a positive experience as well, or sorry, they've had a positive experience where they've gotten a new job and then they pay it forward to the next climber who's in the program today. Um, and so every, and it's part of that ethos and that value system of like, we're a community, we're not just a skills organization, we're a community that supports each other through referrals, through networks, through relationships, through support, through homework help, like through everything. And one aspect of that is that we pay it forward financially. So once I get into the position to pay it forward financially, because I've gotten a new job that pays 30 or 40,000 more than what I was making before, I'm now in the position to support the next person in the program. So it's $150 a month for four years and that $7,200 is what they would pay us. Um, and then in addition to that, the employers, when they hire climbers, they also pay us about 15% of the first year's salary of the climber. And so between those two revenue sources, that pays for the cost of the program. Um, right now, today, we get um, quite a bit of philanthropic support um, to stand up the program um, as we scale. Um, $150 checks don't pay the bills quite yet until we're, you know, serving thousands of people as opposed to hundreds. Um, and so to bridge that gap, we get philanthropic capital, but there's a clear economic model for how operating at scale, we would essentially be solvent and be able to deliver on our mission. Well, why was that economic model important to you as opposed to just only philanthropic dollars or chase a dollar from a foundation or a corporate sponsor? Like, why, why the economic model? So um, this is my third um, startup that I've gotten to build. And the first one that I built was a non-for-profit and all of our revenue was from philanthropic dollars. The second one was a for-profit and I raised venture capital money for, for it. And I think I really learned through both of those experiences that I don't actually really enjoy working with venture capitalists and I don't really enjoy working with philanthropists <laughs> um, and that I actually don't want either one of their money. <laughs> um, what I really want is revenue. <laughs> um, and so um, um, I, I think like for me inventing this third model, um, which was how do you extract um, revenue from the stakeholders that value the product um, seemed like the best way to create a sustainable and solvent organization. 
but not be distracted um, or, or being able to take capital along the way from philanthropists if I needed it for growth or for a startup or whatever, um, as opposed to venture. There are, there are quite a lot of organizations that are in the upskilling space that have taken venture money um, and they have a tremendous amount of pressure from the VCs to essentially get to you know, very high levels of revenue. And the way that they do that is through the students and they have to charge them a lot of money um, and it can feel very predatory. Um, and none of that resonated for me of how I wanted to do it. Um, so I wanted to do it in a way where it had a strong financial model that came from the stakeholders, which were the employers and the participants, but that it was done in a benevolent way that didn't take us off track, where the only thing that would matter was revenue. And um, when you take money from VCs, the only thing that matters is revenue. And even though VCs will tell you, some of them, if they're impact investors, they'll tell you that impact matters. But I have deep suspicion about that. Um, and, you know, revenue, if, if your mission, if your ultimate metric is revenue, then you do that at all costs. And what I found that the organizations or the companies in this space that have taken venture money is that they end up not serving either the people that I want to serve, which are people from low income backgrounds um, in the bottom quartile that are, for, you know, from communities of color. They end up serving white middle class people who want to upskill and, you know, they're paying for that upskilling. Um, and or they might have people of color in the program, but then the charge to what they have to charge them is what I, what I consider to be predatory and, you know, way more unaffordable. And I'm not sure that the outcomes match what the students are paying. And all of that modeling made me not feel great about the for-profit side of it. And so, but I didn't want to just ask philanthropists for money all day long either, and so this sort of felt like a really good way to be a mix in between the two. I, I love the idea of kind of aligning incentives and, and impact between those who benefit, those who run the program, and especially those that come in the future. Well, so Nita, you mentioned this idea of serving hundreds now, but thousands in the future. I'd love to hear your vision for, for climb higher at scale and as you expand and, and you know, the kind of impact you expect to have on the world as, as, you, as you grow. Um, so, so in stage one, the organization's mission is to, um, prove that this model works. And what I mean by that is people from non-traditional backgrounds, people, you know, who are cashiers at Trader Joe's, who are your Lyft and Uber drivers, who are your Starbucks baristas, those people have grit, they have drive, they have aptitude, they have talent. They might not be able to afford college or they might have so many different you know, things pulling at them. So college ends up, ends up not being the answer for them, but it doesn't mean that they don't have aptitude and the right motivation to be incredibly successful in the first time corporate job and sort of to be on that career trajectory. And so you know, our theory of change was that with in-demand skills and relationships that they could break in and they could do great in corporate America. And we needed to prove that. So we proved it first with 23 people and then with 44 people and then with 77 people. And then, and so we've rolled out a series of cohorts that each have a little less than a hundred people, um, one after the other. So there's a slower process, you know, there's a four or five month time lag, you know, between cohorts. Um, and right now, as I said before, 87% of our grads have gotten middle-class jobs. So now stage two is, okay, we've done this for a couple hundred people. What does it look like to do it for closer to a thousand? Um, and that's where we are now. We're going to try to prove this model at the next level. Um, and then, you know, after that, we have quite a number of ways that we can push into what does systemic reform look like, or how do we do this at a much larger level of scale? Like all of those things become options for us. Awesome. Well, so Nita, let me let me ask a couple more questions in real fast. So you, you have this chance to work with with you know, a lot of people in you know with the, the expectation and anticipation of, of upskilling. I'm curious, both uh, in your current role and working with these individuals, but also from your personal experience, um, you know, upgrading your own skills. 
what kind of advice would you give to an audience here of college students, many of whom want to be entrepreneurs themselves at some point, others who, you know, how do I land that really competitive job? Um, what advice would you, you know, given your, say, 20-year-old self about how to prepare for, you know, next job opportunities? Yeah. I mean, first off, I would say, oh, such a good question. I mean, in some ways, <laughs> like the naivete of what it takes to build something from scratch is actually on your side. <laughs> um, like I didn't, I, the first time I built something from scratch was when I was 29 years old. And um, which maybe, I don't know, Aaron, would you even consider that to be older for an entrepreneur or at around the right age? Like, I don't really know, but I had no idea what it would take. 29 fits like right smack dab and like, like the median age. Like, okay, great. So, all right. So I was sort of like average. Um, I hate being average, but um, I'm, I'm average in that way. Right. So, um, and I mean, when you're running something and you have, you know, very little money behind you and very little resources and you're trying to just like make it kind of like get a little bit of traction to get to the next place and the next place. Um, you work a lot. <laughs> um, I, when I was 29, I was working out of a building in downtown Manhattan on Wall Street. And I'd started this organization. Somebody very generously gave us office space. And every day at about 8 p.m., the janitor of the building would walk into my office and say, I'm going to leave here at 12. Like, you have to leave at 12. <laughs> and I would say, come on, can't you give me till one? <laughs> and like, we would have this negotiation of what time I could leave the building. And it was like some ridiculous hour <laughs> that, you know, made no sense. And I, and I'm talking about 12 AM, <laughs> not PM. Right. So there, I mean, there's just a lot of work to get something lifted off the ground. And there's a lot of smoke and mirrors. I sort of like joke, you know, like fake it till you make it. You have to like essentially create a lot of buzz around something that doesn't exist. You have to sell air. You have to, you know, sell, like you have to be a really great storyteller to kind of like get people ready to buy something that doesn't really have outcomes or data or results or um, traction. And, you know, that's hard and you have to be incredibly driven and incredibly motivated and incredibly undeterred by the number of no's that are going to come in your direction. Um, I actually get a lot of fuel from no's. No's kind of make me feel like, all right, you'll be sorry later. <laughs> um, I will, I will come back to you later with really exciting things to say, and you will feel sad that you did not see this brilliance <laughs> like before. Um, so I get fuel from it. A lot of people get discouraged from it. There's a lot of no's. And um, um, so it's a little bit about mindset. It's a little bit of just like, I'm going to like go through a wall. And my the funder who put Climb Higher on the map um, and gave me the first million to start the organization was somebody that works for Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google. And um, I told him about my idea. And I was like, here's what's missing in workforce. Here's what I want to build. And he said, and, and it was in a car ride for about 40 minutes. I had met this guy at a dinner. He and I had a lot of social capital. We had a lot of overlapping networks and people in our in common. But I, you know, he had never, we had never met each other. I offered to give him a ride back to Lafayette. We were coming both coming from the city and live in the Bay Area on the in the East Bay. And, you know, in this car ride, you know, I sort of told him my idea. And at the end of it, he said, I think Eric Schmidt would really like this idea. And I said, Eric Schmidt would not like this idea. Eric Schmidt likes blockchain and AI. And this is about relationships and people. And he said, I still think Eric Schmidt would like it. And you should write me a one pager. And so I did. And the other part about it is that there's just boldness. I wrote a one pager and I asked for $2 million dollars. And he came back and said, I'll give you a million and you have to raise a million against my million. And when Eric Schmidt is your first investor, you get to use that social capital um, to the cows come home. And that's really exciting. But the one thing that this guy, Tom, told me when he gave me that money 
was, are you going to like go through a wall to make this happen, um, to build this from nothing? And that is the one thing that I have. I have like, I will go through a wall. So um, it was sort of fun to like have him ask me that and be like, yeah, like that's what I do. Um, and I don't have any doubt about that. And then everything else is about learning and everything else is about trial and error and everything else is about stumbling all the way through and making a ton of mistakes and pissing some people off along the way and alienating some people by accident and learning what it means to be a good manager. And there's like nothing that you do that you're good at immediately. Very few things is that true for. I'm a good storyteller and I'm a decent fundraiser. And that's been true since a young age, but everything else is all learned. And you have to put the time in to learn those things. I didn't know anything about managing people um, when I started managing people when I was 29. And somebody bought me an executive coach and I role-played every hard conversation I had for five years. And I had a lot of hard conversations with people. I had to fire people. I had to put them on performance improvement plans. I didn't know how to do any of those things. So don't be arrogant. Don't be an asshole. Like don't pretend that you know how to do things you don't know how to do. You got to like go find resources and find support systems and find people who will teach you and mo and mentor you and give you like real-time feedback. Um, Cause otherwise you'll just be a bad leader and like no one's a great leader out of the box. Like everyone feels their way through leadership and everyone's strengths are a little bit different but no one has all of the strengths. Awesome. Well, Nita, we've got a handful of questions that were submitted ahead of time. I'd love to ask a few of these. We'll kind of do them in in rapid fire succession, but a couple of people were asking about your experience at LinkedIn, specifically as an entrepreneur resident. Like, how did that happen? What was that experience like specifically? How did you feel like it set you up for, for what you did after? Um, sorry, so the which experience? The, the LinkedIn. Oh, yeah. the LinkedIn one. So the LinkedIn one is sort of an interesting one because in some ways it was a, a really great resting space. So this happens a little bit after you've built a few organizations is that um, entities that are looking for creative spirits and, you know, people with proven track records, um, they're just like, okay, you're like onto your next thing. You're not sure what's next. Like we need time to like think and cook up stuff. Like come do that here. And that's kind of what LinkedIn did for me. Um, I'd built two organizations. They had both been very successful. I knew that my time was done at, at the, the newer one and, or the more recent one. And I was sort of like in this transition and, and somebody created a role for me at LinkedIn. It was not a formal program. It wasn't, you know, it was just a, like, come hang out here and be here. Um, so I, it was amazing. It was an amazing opportunity to be on the inside of a very prestigious, well-known and well-valued organization. Um, and, um, you know, I just, I got to learn a lot from the people there and build a lot of re great relationships. And, um, and I got a lot of insights that ultimately ended up helping me think about what was missing in the workforce space. So I'm incredibly grateful for that time. But some of that time was really just like processing and thinking, and that's unusual. Um, it's hard to get a year where you get to process and think and ideate and pontificate. And um, somebody was very generous and gave me that. Yeah. Well, what about failure? So how do you think about failure? You launched two successful organizations. Most entrepreneurs aren't, you know, so lucky, fortunate, talented, whatever it is. Yeah. Think about failure as it relates to your entrepreneurial ventures and efforts. Or do you even think about failure? Yeah. I mean, there are, it's also a question of what do you call failure? You know, um, this morning, one of the most valuable people at Climb Higher, who in many ways is responsible for much of the success of the climbers and building an educational experience that has been so transformative for them um, got offered another job and she took it. Um, and our organization is going to be impaired by that. Um, so is that a failure? I don't know. <laughs> it's certainly going to be, a, uh, you know, and uh, I mean, this morning I've been putting out a lot of fires. Um, I, you know, found out that I have a consultant that I hired who's just 
really, really, really hurting our culture right now and doing a lot of trash talking and a lot of unproductive work with us. Um, is that a failure? I don't know, but it is certainly a normal day in my life. <laughs> um, and I have to, I put out a lot of fires like all day long. So one of the things that I learned early on, and this is sort of, so from the ages of 22 to 28, I wasn't an entrepreneur, um, although I did entrepreneurial things within organizations. I was the first ever development director at Teach for America. I worked at the New York City Department of Education during the Mike Bloomberg administration where everything was new and everything was exciting. And I got to build a, a citywide program for $45 million, like from zero as a 24 year old. So I've had like, I had entrepreneurial experiences within larger organizations before I became a full fledged entrepreneur. But when I worked at the Department of Ed, when I was 25, I worked for a woman who was like a drama queen, like every meeting there was yelling there was crying there was trash talking there was drama like there was there was it was just and so the organization always felt like it was on roller skates and it was it was devastating i remember at the time i had a boyfriend who uh, and this woman that i worked for her name was kathy and i would come home every day to this boyfriend and say to him like Kathy really like liked my work today. And then like the day later, I'd be like, Kathy hated my work today. And like, I was just on this like roller coaster emotionally with Kathy, depending on like whether or not I saw Jackal or Hyde or like whatever, you know, whatever personality and everybody who worked around her had the same experiences. And I just, I realized when I sort of like stepped out of that um, was like, she was, she was a really terrible leader because she allowed for just like this cloud of chaos to continuously ensue. And when you run an organization, like something is breaking all day, every day, something's not working all day, every day. And you're putting out fires and you're taking care of it and you're coming up with solutions and you're iterating and you're innovating. Like that's what the work is. And it's fun. Like you can really enjoy that, you know, and you can work on execution and operationalizing it and whatever, but how you engage with the chaos and the debacles and the fires and, you know, has everything to do with your own approach to that stuff. And if you, and so my philosophy very quickly became like, my job is to breathe in all the chaos and to breathe out calm. And like, if I can breathe out calm, then the organization will be calm and it won't be like, oh my God, but this is happening, this is happening, right? Like you don't want people to just like be on roller skates all day long. It is so disorienting and it's really emotionally toxic. And so, you know, how you, what your, what your leadership style looks like really matters, I believe, like to the culture of the organization. And that's the other thing I would say is, um, so one, I learned a lot of things the hard way. I learned what not to be from role models that were not great role models. Um, and you, you can learn in every scenario, not just from good ones. And in fact, I would argue you learn the most from bad scenarios as opposed to good scenarios. Um, and so I, I do a lot of training with my leaders and my directors around like your job is to breathe in chaos and breathe out calm. Well, so it, it begs the question, Nitsan, especially with entrepreneurship, how much of this is the, the talent and skill of the manager, the leader, the founder, how much of it is getting lucky with the thing you build? Like, how, how do you think about luck versus skill versus, I don't know, the, the team you surround yourself with? Um, so when you're in the earliest stages of startup, you hire generalists, you hire people who are gonna to have to wear multiple hats. So I hired somebody a couple of years ago who kind of like did everything. Like she was running our admissions process and our recruitment process and our operations and our outreach to government agencies and our program team and whatever they needed. And just like a ton of, she wore a ton of hats. And to be perfectly honest, like she was really smart and she was really effective at like, she didn't know much about any one thing. And she would just like dig in and like figure it out. And then when that function got too big and there was too much demand and too much work, like then we would start to hire somebody who knew much more about that specific thing. 
And that you can only start to do that as you grow and as you get more revenue or more income or more, you know, funding or capital of whatever kind. And so we went from having like four people on staff in our very earliest days to within 12 months having 10. And then within 12 months of that having 20, um, you know, for maybe a, a company that will seem small, but for a non for profit to go from, you know, 600,000 to 5 million in just a year and a half or two is actually a pretty big jump. Um, and so for the first time ever, we're hiring specialists now. And my goodness, does it make a difference? <laughs> um, it's painful to hire generalists, but you have no choice. And then at some point, hiring people that really know what they're doing is a much more efficient way to operate for sure. Well, uh, Lisa, we've only got a few minutes left, but a lot of people were asking about uh, stories of some of your uh, climbers. Are, are there any uh, specific stories of individuals you could share? This? We, we love the color of, of the impact your work is having. Yeah, um, thank you for asking that. I have hundreds. <laughs> so, um, so I'll tell you about a few. Um, so first I'm going to tell you about Abdul. So um, Abdul is Afghani. Um, he came to this country six years ago and he um, was told um, that he needed to get a college degree. Um, and he came here sort of in search of that American dream. Um, he was enrolled in a community college. He was working at Jack, Jack in the Box during the day. He was a security guard at night and he drove Uber and Lyft on the weekends. I mean, he was sort of the very classic immigrant who just works their ass off. Um, and then he finished, he taught himself English. He finished community college in three years. And then he started applying for a hundred jobs and not one company even did him the service of rejecting him. Um, and I think he sort of was like, gosh, like, what does it take to break in here? Like in this country, like I, no one's even responding to me and I did what I was supposed to do. I got, you know, a degree. I mean, he didn't get a full bachelor's, but for him an associate's degree was really meaningful, but he wasn't getting anywhere. So he found us in part because he was driving an Uber of, to, of somebody in the Bay area who went to the Salesforce building and it made him interested in Salesforce. And so kind of like looked into it and he found us through that. And he enrolled in the program, total star, did super well. And then basically when the program was done, we helped to connect, we helped to make an introduction to him to a company called Gusto, which is one of the you know most sexy, you know, well um, loved um, Silicon Valley fast growing companies in the Bay Area. I think they're on like series E or something like that. Um, he's a, their Salesforce administrator. They hired him initially as a contract to hire role. Um, and, um, they were, they were um, paying him about $30 an hour. So about a $60,000 salary. And like, that was a lot more than what he was making before. And I was really happy for him within a few months, they converted him to a full-time job. And that came with a $72,000 salary. And then, um, within, and, and, I knew that they were paying him a little less than market rate. Like, I think they should have offered him 75, but they offered him 72. I was like, you know what? That's great. Like, I'm happy for you. Like this, and it was a really, I think, wonderful jump for him. So, and then about two months later, they surprised him with a $13,000 job um, wage increase because they quickly realized that he was going to get snatched up fast um, and realized that like they needed to pay him more. So he's now making $86,000 and, um, and is, you know, at the top of our um, climber community in terms of pay. He came back as a fellow, as alum, he taught all the next climbers and now all those people have jobs. And his boss sent us an email a couple of weeks ago with the subject heading, send me another Abdul. Um, and that's what this is all about. <laughs> like Abdul opens the, do the door for the next one and the next one and the next one. IBM hired four of our people. It was a big question. Like, will they want more? Will they want more? They just signed up for another 10. Discord, um, which I'm sure many of you use on a daily basis. Like they hired three and now they came back to us and are like, 
send us as many people as you can. Like we want all of them. <laughs> um, and so we're just seeing the social capital components of the model, like really, really um, open up in this like really powerful way that I'm really, really proud of. But I have one like more nuanced view of this. And that is really about that personal evolution that happens in the program. When you're learning something hard, when you're coming with maybe not that much confidence, when you didn't have that much success in school, you know, or maybe you did, but like are still kind of like in low wage jobs and like you know, our society isn't great to those frontline workers at Target and at Walmart. And maybe many of you might work at places like that and, or have, um, but there's a lot of trauma, a lot of anxiety, low confidence, um, mental health challenges that many climbers come to us with. And we like spend a lot of time in community learning hard things together. And I think that through that, there is a transformation in confidence by learning with people and building that relationships and social capital. And so this is a note that I got earlier yesterday that um, I wanted to read to you. It says, hi, Nitsan. I remember lying in bed at 1 a.m. on a chilly Friday night back in February, feeling hopeless, scrolling through an endless maze of job opportunities. At the time, I was working part-time for a nonprofit, but I was not making enough to get by. I recently found out about Salesforce administration and had been reading that breaking into the field was incredibly difficult. And then all of a sudden, I saw this ad for a program called Climb Higher, a program geared towards getting overlooked talent into tech. It was at that moment that I felt hope for the first time since COVID-19 lockdowns had started. Somehow, this program seemed right one that would proudly take in those who had struggled in life, immigrants, those with learning disabilities like me and people of color. I filled out the initial application and I remember a question asking why I wanted to do this. And I answered, this program would change my life. And it did. Recently, I was hired to be one of two founding members for the Salesforce team at an ed tech startup. This position pays more than double any other job I've ever had. But this change isn't the only one that matters. Instead, it's now, it's that now I believe in myself. I have confidence in myself as a professional and as a leader. A year ago, I wondered if I had a future at all. And now I'm asking myself just how bright that future can be. The best part has been watching those I've grown to care so much about grow alongside of myself. Nowhere is there a community more supportive than that of Climb Higher. These climbers and the staff are incredible and seeing where they all go as they too learn to believe in themselves is amazing. You're creating this program. Thank you for creating this program. It really does change lives. Carter. He's on, that's amazing. Thank you so much for the work you do. Thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate you taking time out of a, you know, a firefighting schedule to come and, and chat with us. But um, everybody, let's give Nitsan a round of applause. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you, everybody. If you want to stay connected to this work, um, feel free to send me a note on LinkedIn, and um, I'm happy to connect with any of you. And if any of you have any follow-up questions, you can send me a note on LinkedIn too, and I'd be happy to engage with any of you individually. Um, thanks so much for inviting me, Aaron, and for the privilege of getting to tell this story. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being here, Nitsan. Enjoy your day and your weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.